Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True, by Richard Dawkins. So I'm going to give you the blurb, I'm going to start going through and reading out my tabs. Uh, I think that's probably, especially with a non-fiction book, is probably the best way to go about it. So, magic takes many forms. The ancient Egyptians explained the night by suggesting that the goddess Nut swallowed the sun. The Vikings believed a rainbow was the god's bridge to earth. These are magical, extraordinary tales. But there is another kind of magic, and it lies in the exhilaration of discovering the real answers to these questions. It is the magic of reality, science. Packed with inspiring explanations of space, time and evolution, laced with humour and clever thought experiments, the magic of reality explores a stunningly wide range of natural phenomena. What is stuff made of? How old is the universe? What causes tsunamis? Who was the first man or woman? This is a page-turning, inspirational detective story that not only mines all the sciences for its clues, but primes the reader to think like a scientist too. Richard Dawkins elucidates the wonders of the natural world to all ages with his inimitable clarity and exuberance in a text that will enlighten and inform for generations to come. So this basically takes the form of a bunch of chapters that answer questions, so I'm going to read out those questions for you first. So we have, what is reality? What is magic? Who was the first person? Why are there so many different kinds of animals? What are things made of? Why do we have night and day, winter and summer? What is the sun? What is a rainbow? When and how did everything begin? Are we alone? What is an earthquake? Why do bad things happen? And what is a miracle? So we get started with what is reality? What is magic? So I liked this. Uh, I liked this here, which kind of this is the second group of uh, the second type of magic, which is you know, and it's done by sleight of hand and psychology and things like that. But I like the distinctions that he draws here. Some conjurers are honest and go out of their way to make sure their audiences know that they have simply performed a trick. I'm thinking of people like James the Amazing Randy, or Penn and Teller, or Darren Brown. Even though these admirable performers don't usually tell the audience exactly how they did the trick, they could be thrown out of the magic circle, the conjurers club, if they did that. They do make sure the audience knows that there was no supernatural magic involved. Others don't actively spell out that it was just a trick, but they don't make exaggerated claims about what they have done either. They just leave the audience with a rather enjoyable sensation that something mysterious has happened, without actively lying about it. But unfortunately there are some conjurers who are deliberately dishonest, and who pretend they really do have supernatural or paranormal powers. Perhaps they claim that they really can bend metal or stop clocks by the power of thought alone. Some of these dishonest fakes, charlatans is a good word for them, earn large fees from mining or oil companies by claiming that they can tell, using psychic powers, where would be a good place to drill. Other charlatans exploit people who are grieving by claiming to be able to make contact with the dead. When this happens, it is no longer just fun or entertainment, but preying on people's gullibility and distress. To be fair, it may be that not all of these people are charlatans. Some of them may sincerely believe they are talking to the dead. He made a really good point here as well. Um, basically, the chance of any particular set of... Uh, basically, the chance of cards being dealt in any particular way... It's almost impossibly small, and we would think it was a miracle if, you know, four players each got dealt 13 cards and they each had a perfect hand of, you know, all the spades, all the clubs, all the diamonds, all the hearts. <laughs> Basically, we would notice that because we're, we're kind of programmed with human brains to see patterns in things when there isn't really a pattern there. And so actually the chances of that happening are exactly the same as any other deal happening, you know? Which is actually why I believe... Like, whenever you deal a pack of cards, it's unlikely that they've ever been dealt in that precise order before. He's talking about um, DNA here as well, so I'm going to read this out. But of course, not all humans are the same as all other humans, and not all baboons are the same as all other baboons, and not all mice are the same as all other mice. We could compare your genes with mine, letter by letter, and the result? We don't. We turn out to have even more letters in common than either of us does with a chimpanzee. But we'd still find some letters that are different. Not many, and there's no particular reason to single out the Fox B2 gene. But if you counted up the numbers of letters all humans share in all our genes, it would be more than any of us shares with a chimpanzee. And you share more letters with your cousin than you share with me. And you share even more letters with your mother and your father and, if you have one, with your sister or brother. In fact, you can work out how closely related any two people are to each other by counting the number of DNA letters they share. It's an interesting count to make, and it is something we are probably going to hear more about in the future. For example, the police will be able to track somebody down if they have the DNA fingerprint of his brother. Which I find deeply troubling and disturbing, but hey ho, that's what technology is all about. So I like this comparison here between genes and language. So Dawkins says, uh, why should the numbers of different genes change as the generations go by? Well, you might say it would be surprising if they didn't, given such immensities of time. Think of the way language changes over the centuries. Words like thee and thou, zounds and avast. Phrases like stat me vitals have now more or less dropped out of English. On the other hand, the phrase I was like, meaning I said, which would have been incomprehensible as recently as 20 years ago, 
is now commonplace. So is cool as a term of approval. And I find it particularly interesting that cool in French is cool. C'est cool. Uh, this is the, I want to read here the opening couple of paragraphs to the, chap uh, to the chapter on Are We Alone? So far as I know, there are few, if any, ancient myths about alien life elsewhere in the universe, perhaps because the very idea of there being a universe vastly bigger than our own world hasn't been around all that long. It took until the 1500s for scientists to see clearly that the Earth orbits the Sun, and that there are other planets that do so too. But the distance and number of the stars, let alone other galaxies, were unknown and undreamed of until relatively modern times. And it isn't that long since people first realised that the direction we call straight up in one part of the world, for example Borneo, would be straight down in another part of the world, in this case Brazil. Before then people thought that up was the same direction everywhere, towards the place where the gods lived, above the sky. There have long been numerous legends and beliefs about strange alien creatures near at hand. Demons, spirits, jinns, ghosts, the list goes on. But in this chapter when I ask are we alone, I'm going to mean are there alien life forms on other worlds elsewhere in the universe? As I said, myths about aliens in this sense are rare among primitive tribes. They are all too common, however, among modern city dwellers. These modern myths are interesting because, unlike ancient myths, we can actually watch as they start. We see myths being dreamed up before our very eyes, so the myths in this chapter will be modern. And he starts by talking about the Heaven's Gate cult, which is one of these notorious cults. They thought that aliens were coming, so they all committed suicide. Eh. So here he talks about sleep paralysis and he says, But occasionally there is a delay between your mind returning to consciousness and your muscles coming back to life, and that is called sleep paralysis. It is frightening, as you can imagine. You are sort of awake and you can see your bedroom and everything in it, but you can't move. Sleep paralysis is often accompanied by terrifying hallucinations. People feel surrounded by a sense of dreadful danger, which they can't put a name to. Sometimes they even see things that are not there, just as in a dream. And also as in a dream. To the dreamer, they seem absolutely real. And I had a, a spot of, well, I've had sleep paralysis on and off throughout the years, but uh, one that I remember was I was at my dad's house in Spain and we were like doing the foundations beneath the building. And I had this nightmare that we discovered a skeleton down there and then I woke up with sleep paralysis and I heard this deep booming voice shouting, GET OUT! But also I recognised it as sleep paralysis, so, you know, after I woke up properly and whatnot, I was back under the house again. <laughs> so uh, there's a chapter on why do bad things happen as well, I think this is quite an interesting little introduction. Why do bad things happen? After a dreadful disaster such as an earthquake or a hurricane, you'll hear people saying things like this. It's so unfair! What did those poor people ever do to deserve such a fate? If a really good person gets a painful disease and dies while a really bad person remains in the best of health, once again we cry, unfair, or we say, where's the justice in that? It's hard to resist this feeling that somehow there ought to be a kind of natural justice. Good things should happen to good people. Bad things, if they must happen at all, should only happen to bad people. In Oscar Wilde's delightful play, The Importance of Being Earnest, an elderly governess called Miss Prism explains how long ago she wrote a novel. When she is asked whether it ended happily, she replies, The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. Real life is different. Bad things do happen, and they happen to good people as well as bad. Why? Why is real life not like Miss Prism's fiction? Why do bad things happen? So this is quite cool. This is about Sod's Law slash Murphy's Law. Um, and this is again in Why Do Bad Things Happen? Do bad things happen more often than we ought to expect by chance alone? If so, then we really do have something to explain. You may have heard people refer jokingly to Murphy's Law, sometimes called Sod's Law. This states, if you drop a piece of toast and marmalade on the floor, it always lands marmalade side down. Or more generally, if a thing can go wrong, it will. People often joke about this, but at times you get the feeling they think it is more than a joke. They really do seem to believe the world is out to get them. I do a certain amount of filming for television documentaries, and one of the things that can go wrong in filming on location is unwanted noise. When an aircraft drones in the distance, you have to stop filming and wait for it to go, and this can be extremely irritating. Costume dramas of life in earlier centuries are ruined by even a trace of aircraft noise. Film people have a superstition that aircraft deliberately choose moments when silence is most important to fly overhead, and they invoke Sod's Law. Recently, a film crew I was working with chose a location where we felt sure there would be a minimum of noise, a huge empty meadow near Oxford. We arrived early in the morning to make doubly sure of peace and quiet, only to discover when we arrived, a lone Scotsman practising the bagpipes, perhaps banished from the house by his wife. Sod's law, we all proclaimed. Here's something that I didn't know, uh, it says, um, People used to think it was a good idea if children caught mumps, say, because the immune system's memory would protect them against getting it as an adult. And mumps is even more unpleasant for adults, especially men because it attacks the testicles, than it is for children. Haha, <laughs> testicle mumps, that sounds painful. Here we have what is a miracle, and um, 
Dawkins here talks about something I've heard about before, uh, David Hume, he's a Scottish thinker from the 18th century. So uh, it said, he's, Dawkins writes, if you want to know Hume's actual words, here they are, but you have to remember that he wrote them more than two centuries ago, and English style has changed since then. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. So the idea being, it's, it kind of comes back to Sherlock Holmes as well, like, and Occam's razor as well, where the simplest explanation is normally true. So for example, if someone tells you that they've been abducted by aliens, is it more likely that they've been abducted by aliens, or that they're simply mistaken, or that perhaps they think they've been abda ab yeah, abducted by aliens, but they weren't? He kind of builds on that with this bit. The more you think about it, the more you realise that the very idea of a supernatural miracle is nonsense. If something happens that appears to be inexplicable by science, you can safely conclude one of two things. Either it didn't really happen, the observer was mistaken, or was lying, or was tricked, or we have exposed a shortcoming in present day science. If present day science encounters an observation, or an experimental result, that it cannot explain, then we should not rest until we have improved our science so that it can provide an explanation. If it, requ if it requires a radically new kind of science, a revolutionary science so strange that old scientists scarcely recognise it as science at all, that's fine too. It's happened before. But don't ever be, but don't ever be lazy enough, defeatist enough, cowardly enough, to say it must be supernatural or it must be a miracle. Say instead that it's a puzzle, it's strange, it's a challenge that we should rise to. Whether we rise to the challenge by questioning the truth of the observation or by expanding our science in new and exciting directions, the proper and brave response to any such challenge is to tackle it head on. And until we have found a proper answer to the mystery, it's perfectly okay simply to say, this is something we don't yet understand, but we're working on it. Indeed, it is the only honest thing to do. So all in all, I did think this was pretty enjoyable. The problem for me is that it's so huge that it could never cover everything that you could hope for from it. He could have made it two or three times longer, but then I think it would have been too long. So I don't really know how I would suggest improving that. I think maybe he was just a little over ambitious with this book. But yeah, it was still worth reading, you know, interesting enough popular science. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True by Richard Dawkins. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Let me uh, Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.